Good afternoon. I'm Desiree Dembski Hamlin, Deputy Director of Freedom's Way National Heritage Area. On behalf of Freedom's Way, I'd like to welcome you to Successful Strategies for Family Programming, the second session in our second webinar series, Creating Engaging Experiences for Families in a Digital World. I'd like to thank Freedom's Way board member, Susie Fonda, for organizing this series, and our partners, Laura Howick with the Fitchburg Art Museum, Allison Schilling with the Concord Museum, and Elizabeth Leahy with the Discovery Museum. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, Freedom's Way National Heritage Area works with partners across 45 communities in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Our mission is to promote, protect, and enhance the natural, cultural, and historical resources of those communities. After the success of our first webinar series back in November, we decided to offer a second series to encourage the development of family programs for our annual Hidden Treasures program, which is coming up in May. And this year, it's been reimagined as the Hidden Treasures Festival of Nature, Culture, and History. So more information will be coming out about that shortly, and we hope you'll consider developing a program um, to partner with us during that month. So last week, we received an introduction to best practices and family learning from Jennifer Zanoli with the USS Constitution Museum. And this week, we're going to take a deeper dive and see what some of our partners have been up to and, and doing in this field uh, across the heritage area. I'd like to pass it over to Susie, our facilitator for today's session. Susie Fonda is a Freedom's Way board member and an educator with 15 years of experience in museums, including the Concord Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, and the Plymouth Patuxent Museums, which was formerly Plymouth Plantation. Welcome, Susie. Thanks, Desiree. Um, and uh, before I can't um, uh, leave the session without giving a huge thank you to Desiree, who is so great at getting all of the details together and uh, uh, handling all of the technology, um, you know, you think you know technology and then all of a sudden, um, you know, you, you start to realize all the things you don't know. So, um, so a huge thank you to, to her for uh, helping uh, to put this together. Um, so, um, so thank you to all of you who were here last week um, to hear from Jennifer about, uh, about family programs at the USS Constitution Museum and the ways um, in which an, that family learning is such an important part of um, of cultural institutions and what we can learn from families and what families can learn from us. Um, and so for the second part of our series, we decided to bring it down um, to some of, uh, to a more of a local level and uh, talk to uh, colleagues from around the region, from around the 45 towns of the Freedom's Way area to, um, to talk about some of the specific work that they've been doing with families, uh, particularly in this crazy time of uh, coronavirus and social distancing and all of those types of things. So um, we chose um, three institutions who uh, represent kind of the three different areas of, um, of Freedom's Way's uh, mission, uh, which is culture, history, and uh, nature. So, um, so we have a little bit of everything going on here. So hopefully, um, we're hoping you'll get some ideas um, for some things you might try at your own institutions um, and uh, be able to uh, uh, get to know some of the great resources for families that are right here, uh, very close to home. Um, so we're going to start today. Uh, we're going to start with culture, if you will, um, with uh, Laura Howick, who is the Director of Education at the Fitchburg Art Museum. So Laura, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Susie. Well, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, so our online offerings for families pre-pandemic were fairly basic. Um, we had a section on our website with some tips for families, uh, things to do before, during, and after your visit. And uh, the, during your visit, we also had a list of some gallery activities that families could do. And uh, most of our sort of family friendliness was really focused inside the museum. Um, we have these educational interactive spaces called learning lounges. Um, they're mostly attached to our contemporary art exhibitions and they include things like uh, information about the artists and their techniques touchable materials, uh, information about the historical context of the art, videos, and hands-on art activities. And this was really a way to help our visitors understand contemporary art, which was fairly new to the Fitchburg area. 
We also have a learning lounge for our long-term African art exhibition and our permanent Discover Ancient Egypt gallery is also quite interactive. So what you're looking at here on the right, you see a table where they can do an art activity. And farther down the wall, there's some information about an artist. And this is really just a small part of the Learning Lounge. So when the pandemic hit, uh, you know, we decided, I think, on a Friday to close. And um, we came in for a couple more days. So I literally, uh, I think we all went into the scramble mode or phase of trying to what they call pivot. I think we're all tired of that word. Um, but when we made that decision to close, um, I spent some of my last hours at work writing art activities that could be done using just some basic household supplies, um, nothing fancy. And um, we got these up online um, because I knew parents were going to have a lot of bored kids at home all of a sudden. I also included a tips for creating art with kids. Um, this is a wonderful resource. I did not write it. Um, you can see where it's from. But I included it because I know a lot of parents don't have experience working with art materials or with constructively guiding their children through making art. We also, in that you know, scramble mode of let's get some stuff up quick, um, we took one of the interactive activities from the Egyptian gallery, which is a um, interview activity where you can interview for different jobs. And we turned it into a quiz that we were able to put um, on, I think we put it out on Twitter. So it goes on for several pages. In mid-March, um, right before we closed, we had just opened our winter exhibition of contemporary art. And of course, we also had a learning lounge to accompany that. Um, so we moved the exhibition online with lots of photos. And then we also moved a lot of the images and labels, um, obviously the two dimensional kinds of things that we could take from the learning lounge and put online. We uh, couldn't do the touchable interactive things. I also created a treasure hunt for it for younger kids and for older kids and adults, um, sort of a reflect, connect, create sheet because um, this is an exhibition about loss and we really wanted people to make some more personal connections with it. Um, my education fellow also made some art activities that related directly to some of the artworks that were in the exhibition. So on the left, you see two artworks that were in the exhibition, and then on the right, her examples um, from the activity. She also made uh, videos of a couple of the techniques used in the exhibition, but she adapted them for um, being able to do them at home with just basic materials. So these are just some screenshots from the video um, showing a printmaking process. And this turned out to be one of our most popular videos. Um, I checked yesterday and it had, it's had 988 views, which I realize isn't huge, um, but for us, uh, it, you know, this is new territory. And then um, we reopened in July and then we had to close again. But meanwhile, in September, we had opened up um, our winter exhibitions and focused on photography. And because I couldn't um, have any touchable things in the learning lounge, I, you know, not even paper things that people could pick up, um, I created the activities um, and made them as large wall labels that people could then photograph. So this was sort of trying to adapt to you know, being restricted by COVID restrictions. We also have resources um, that aren't necessarily in the section aimed at families, but which are available to them through our website. And these are two exhibitions featuring our African art collection um, on the left, uh, the cloth is money textiles from the Sahal. 
These are links and resources from other sites, but they include um, being able to listen to African music or hear a famous epic poem and art activities. And on the right, um, for the Moving Objects African and Oceanic Art Exhibition, we have several pages of links to videos um, that relate to the objects in the exhibition. Um, our curator of African art is, uh, she, she always gets a lot of information and resources when she does an exhibition and we just don't have room for it all in, in the exhibition. So this is how we cope with that. Last December for the holiday break, our education fellow, this is a different one, um, created uh, several videos of ancient art the Egyptian art projects, and we featured them on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel instead of on our website. And we had a much higher response on these platforms. Um, between all five of them, we've had 5,933 views on Facebook. Over the months, I've been able to add more art activities. These are based on our permanent collection um, and I include a section that has more information about helping people to get started with the projects, what kinds of supplies they'll need for any of the activities, and then some of the supplies they'd need for specific activities. This is an example of one of those lessons. Um, this is based on a contemporary art work in our collection by Joe Landry, and he makes these incredible realistic reproductions of buildings. So if you know Fitchburg, this is the Moran Square Diner. Um, and it's, it's, see, it's about, I think, 18 to 20 inches or so wide if you saw it in, in real life. Um, so we use that as inspiration to talk to kids about recreating something or a building or making their own building, but displaying it on the wall instead of just sitting it. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Um, so it was great to hear about uh, some of the some of the great ways that you're making use of your collection and um, bringing it and giving people the opportunity to uh, to learn from it um, while they're at home and can't be with the actual artwork. So thank you. Um, so now I'm gonna turn it um, to uh, an institution that I know fairly well, uh, which is the Concord Museum and to my former colleague, Allison Schilling, who is the manager of public programs, uh, who's gonna talk us through some of the things they've been doing uh, with families uh, over the last year. Thank you, Susie. Thanks everyone. Um, so what I'm mostly gonna talk about today is the programs that we did around family trees this past year. So Family Trees is an annual celebration at the Concord Museum. It's one of my favorite times of the year because it's when we get to completely go all out focusing on families who are coming to the museum. We have these trees that are beautifully decorated based on children's books. And um, now for generations, kids and adults have been coming to see these beautiful trees. Um, we always have related programs during Family Trees. It's a very busy time for us. So one of the most special days is an afternoon with authors and illustrators where local authors and illustrators who are featured in the exhibit get to come to the museum and meet kids and have their books signed and talk about storytelling. And it's a, a really fun day where authors and illustrators get to meet one another, get to meet their fans. And I mean, sometimes it, this is the first time a child realizes that like a real person made this book that they love so much. And it's, um, it's a really special day. So this past December was the 25th anniversary of Family Trees. And it was a, gonna be a really big celebration. We were very excited. We've been gearing up for a long time for it. And luckily we were able to open family trees and people were able to visit with time ticketing and spacing out. And it was really special that people got to experience family trees, but it was very clear we weren't gonna be able to bring a bunch of authors and illustrators into the museum and have the programs like we, we have in the past. So I was really excited to get to make a virtual 
author and illustrator event. And the, um, I can share my screen now to just show you the main landing page. So we had been doing some, we'd been experimenting with some virtual family programs. Uh, we've been sending out these publications, History at Home, where we would highlight objects and share videos and there would usually be a family activity attached to that. But this was the first time where it was all about families and that was totally the focus. So one of the main goals that I've had throughout this whole virtual experience was um, that we would use this virtual platform of sending these activities out as a jumping off point. So the activity wouldn't be entirely on the computer, entirely virtual, but this would facilitate some kind of greater learning, getting to go outside, do something hands-on and um, learn, but also have fun. It is family programs after all, we're allowed to have fun. So in making the Family Trees um, author illustrator program, I really wanted to do something that was immersive, but also let families know that they could do more. So here we have the home screen. And as you can see, I had incredible things to work with. Um, Melissa Sweet and Kwame Alexander were one of the first author illustrator pairs to get back to me and say that they were thrilled to be asked and wanted to participate. And while I was completely starstruck, I held it together and um, made a really cool video with them. So here's the, the home screen and then we can scroll down to see Friday. We also have a page up here. So this was, we're able to see some of the illustrations and then embedded right here is the video. This was one of the things I really wanted to do when we send out the history at home emails, there's a video attached, but when you click on it, you end up going to YouTube and you leave the page. So one of the things that I really wanted to do was to stay here so we can meet Kwame here. I'll, we can have a little teaser. So we can meet Kwame and we can see. My name is Melissa Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I am a celebrated artist who makes the best lobster rolls for my friends. <laughs> and I just love the world. And I try to bring that passion and love of the world to my art for kids and young and old. My <laughs> name is Kwame Alexander. And the thing I love most about my life is speaking, talking, writing words. And those words people have told me make me listen to the world differently. I'm happy to be here. So it's a little teaser, but their book was how to read a book. And so just, we had little prompts, like how do you like to read a book? And that's something that they talk about the next segment is they share their favorite way to read a book. And um, Melissa leaves us with this activity to create a collage from a word. So I recreated it here. Um, and it was just a lot of fun to get to create this platform that was somewhat playful and engaging. I mean, using these just incredible illustrations. And um, one of the most special parts was it was very moving to see the interest from the authors and illustrators to participate in this. You know, I wasn't sure really if they would want to do a, a virtual program. It's very different than what I've asked them in the past to do. Um, but to a person, they said, this is so special. You know, the, the holidays will be hard this year. And, and if we can make a fun video and give families an activity to do together, then that's one positive thing that we can share. So um, I was completely blown away to have, you know, Melissa Sweet and Kwame Alexander and Grace Lynn and M Maria Ekere, um Tali coming to do this program with us. It was um, really, really outstanding. Um, so, and it was a lot of fun because I got to do it over a whole weekend. Usually it's just one afternoon where 
lots of authors and illustrators come, but um, we had a, a lot of visitation on the site because every day for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I made a, a bonus page, um, we got to release a new, a new program and a new activity. So um, it kept people coming back to see what we were gonna do next, which was a lot of fun. This was a really special experience. It was a way to engage families. A lot of the people who visited the site and participated in the program also got to come to Family Trees in person. Um, but many people didn't come to Family Trees. So like Laura was saying, this was a way that when people are at home and can't get out of the house, this was something that they could do together and read a good book watch a good video and make some art. You know, nothing wrong with that. Sounds like a good weekend to me. Um, and it, it was also very successful because Family Trees is such a long-standing tradition with the museum. Um, being in our 25th year and having it be during COVID was a, a challenge, but it was really moving to see the response from both the authors and illustrators, as well as from our longstanding members and even people who are new to the museum. And this is the first time that they participated in a program or activity with us. So it was um, a really special way to get to reach our, our family. Thank you. Thanks, Allison. Um, so it's so great to see how a program that was always so popular uh, with, with visitors and how you, how you were able to take that program and bring it um, and uh, into something that was that still reflected the um, you know the spirit of the program, but uh, was able to to do it in you know with the reality of of how things are at this time. So uh, so it's great to see. So thanks, Allison. Um, so finally, uh, last but not least, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Liz Leahy, who, who is the Director of STEM Education at uh, the Discovery Museum uh, here in Acton, uh, where I live. It's actually right up the street. Um, and uh, they, too, have done a lot of stuff with families. And um, so I'm eager to hear um, some of the work that they've been doing. So turn it over to you, Liz. Great. Thank you, Susie. So I just figured, you know, real quick for anyone who maybe isn't super familiar with us or hasn't visited us in a while, um, we are the Discovery Museum located in Acton. And in 2017, we opened a brand new museum building. Um, and the year before that, we had opened Discovery Woods, which is our outdoor nature playscape. Um, and Discovery Woods is sort of acts as a portal for us to the 180 acres of Great Hill Conservation Land that is connected to the museum's property. So we had always had a trailhead on our um, on our property. It was it was off of our parking lot previously, and so it was really great to be able to um, you know kind of create a space that we really see as a bridge to to getting families. Um, outside and outdoors and enjoying nature. Um, so just a little bit about our mission there and, and a few snapshots from inside the building. Um, you know, we, um, like everyone, we closed uh, in March and we were, um, you know, we've been fortunate that we've been able to stay open since we reopened at the end of July last year um, and you know again very similar to everyone time ticketing you know capacity limits in both the building and our galleries um, but you know we really worked hard to maintain the open-ended and hands-on nature of, of the experience that we offer at the museum so um, and obviously all those pictures are are unmasked children so so pre-covid so um, you know um, our, our, the images populating our, our website now are, are very different. Um, but today I figured I would just speak a little bit about um, the creation of our Discovery Museum at home page. And, um, you know, this is a resource very similar to, to the resources Laura and Allison both just talked about. Um, you know, so when we closed, um, you know, that idea of, uh, Laura mentioned, you know, kind of entering scramble mode <laughs> um, was very much something you know, we experienced as well um, in terms of, you know, how do we want to keep connecting to our audience and our visitors um, while we can't have them in our building. 
Um, and, you know, for us, this really sort of was something that always fell in the bucket of, you know, wouldn't it be nice, <laughs> right? So I think, you know, as with most museums, kind of the gold standard is, is how do we keep engaging our visitors once they leave our museum? You know, how do we keep them coming back for more? How do we inspire them to keep, you know, exploring um, when they get home? You know, and this idea of, oh, well, we could, you know, put some activity ideas and things up on the website, you know, to correlate with each exhibit or, um, and, as with most things, you know, it, it, that, you know, idea was never really something that was able to rise um, to the top of everyone's to-do list. And then the pandemic forced our hand on that. So um, our discovery at home page um, has grown a lot over the past year. Um, so, you know, we kind of just opened with a little bit of, of family play and learning at home. Um, I think that idea of, you know, one thing we also wanted to came up a little earlier as well as the idea of kids being bored, right? So there's a couple of resources down at the bottom there about like, you know, it's also okay to be bored <laughs> every now and again. You know, I think we were creating this at a time where that idea of just like, you know, parents trying to find a new activity every 10 minutes to keep their kids engaged is, you know, can be overwhelming. So, hey, why don't you let your kids be, be bored for a little while? Um, so we've populated this page with activity um, ideas that sort of span um, a wide variety of, of topics and content areas. Um, so, and a lot of them are modeled after the programming that we offer at the museum and sort of fall under, you know, the very broad umbrella categories that we might offer in our calendar of family programming. So, thinking about backyard and beyond. So those are really the activities that encourage families to get outdoors together, especially for littles. So that was an area cultivated by our um, director of early childhood at the time and you know, really connected to some of the philosophies and messaging coming out of our brain building together area, which is just for kids ages three and under. We've got everyday engineering, kitchen chemistry, uh, make a masterpiece, math, and move your body. So you can see some of these areas a little more <laughs> uh, populated than others, perhaps with <laughs> different activity ideas. Um, but you know, a lot of these came from sort of old program plans. So some of it was taking things that we only had hard copies of, and you know, using some folks who maybe whose own work was on pause at the time to literally start like transcribing those into formats. Um, and, and also going back and looking through our own program plans of, of what do we feel can really translate well to at home, um, thinking again about that idea of simple materials, materials that are readily available for families at home. Um, you know, admittedly, when we look at this page, um, you know, I think one thing we've thought a lot about at the museum is it's pretty dense. And, um, you know, when you start scrolling through all these things, you know, I think our, our next step is maybe to think about how can we sort these a little differently or a little better just to make them a little more ex accessible for folks. Um, but, you know, I think this is definitely a resource where we're going to continue to grow and evolve over time. So when you click on any one of those um, activity ideas, this is the type of thing you might see. So they pop up as separate PDFs on the on the website. So we have, you know, again, a, a wide range of, of what you might find. So we have things like, um, again, you know, like Laura was mentioning tips pages, right? So, you know, how to engage in messy activities at home. Um, you know, how, how can you make cleanup that much easier for yourself um, when you're getting messy with kids? Um, you know, we have one based on sort of our you know, go-to tips and tricks for taking a hike with your family. You know, how can you build up to that idea of maybe you just start by visiting the park and, you know, you work, you don't have to just head out on a two mile hike right away, right? You can, you can start slow and, and build over time. Um, so you might encounter things like that. And then we have, you know, straight up activity ideas. So this one, in per, you know, the next one in particular, in particular, excuse me, is let's go fly a kite. Um, so this was an activity um, that we had put up on the website as part of in April. Yeah, it's April, that's National Kite Month. Um, and we had um, created, I'll, I'll touch on this earlier, but this was also something we did as part of, or touch on this in a little bit, but some we do as part of um, 
our weekly emails that we, we send out to our email list. Um, but again, when you, you know, when putting these together, we, we really tried to think about um, a wide variety of materials and things that families might come have at home. So in this particular one, I, I chose this one to feature just because this was an activity that actually gave me a lot of trouble <laughs> when it came to, to getting it ready to put on the website. And, you know, the more I thought about it, um, the more I realized, because when we do this one with our visitors at the museum, it really is all about a materials exploration, right? And so what we do is we provide a whole wide range of materials and we, you know, we also have a few write-ups of little, of templates that, that families could follow, right? There's sort of a preconceived notion of, I know what a kite looks like. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I know how to build one, but I know what it should look like. Um, and wanting to balance that free exploration while also helping families feel like they might have a successful experience. Um, and, and so, you know, wide range of materials paired with a couple of templates or ideas for how they might assemble a kite and really then just letting them have at it. And that was really hard to translate into a one to two page <laughs> PDF. And so, um, you know, it was thinking about how can we talk about all the different materials you might experience or um, have at home to experiment with. And, and really it just came down to calling that out and saying, you know, this is your chance to play with materials. These are only suggestions. What else might you have at home to play with? And then um, this is only the first page of, of this particular document. There's a second page as well, but then it was also providing you know, a look at a step-by-step -step walkthrough of, of how you might build a kite and then sort of um, ending it with, you know, now that you have a start and some basics for how you want to put your kite together, you know, what other designs might you try? Um, how else might you, um, you know, continue to explore this activity? Um, so with it, so the weekly emails that I mentioned, so one thing we've also been doing um, is we send out an email, usually on Wednesdays or Thursdays of any given week, um, and these emails are on a specific topic. So what we try to do is, is we take a topic and that can be, um, you know, we look to the calendar of fun and silly holidays, right, as inspiration, for example, the one we just put out this week was National Backwards Day. So if anyone didn't know, this coming Sunday is National Backwards Day. So, you know, you can wear your shirts backwards on purpose <laughs> um, for all those times you've accidentally done it. Um, and we try to really kind of build out that theme a little bit with, we also are making videos as well. So we keep them super short. We try to do, you know, no more than two minutes or so. Um, and again, some of them are just sort of the hint of the idea. Some of them are walking visitors through, um, you know, how to do a very quick and specific thing. So um, for example, with the backwards day, I did mirror writing. And so it was just very quickly, you know, try writing backwards, hold it up to a mirror, what does it look like? Um, and we also use these as a chance to, again, so a lot of the activity ideas that now live on the Discovery at Home were um, delivered through these email formats. So for example, you can see in this um, particular one, the focus was on maps and it was based on a map that Leonardo da Vinci had created. Um, we have a space in the museum called the Da Vinci Workshop, and it's about, you know, engaging visitors and open-ended creating and inventing um, in the spirit of Leonardo da Vinci. And so our da Vinci educator um, found this really awesome map that da Vinci had created, and, and how did he, how was he able to create this without the use of GPS technology and satellite imaging and all of that. Um, and you know, from there, you know, he was able to connect people to the idea of we have maps on our website through our orienteering activities. Um, we also tend to link to other resources we think are cool that visitors might like to explore, be it um, other people's videos or, you know, just a really cool web page with some interesting information. Um, and then, you know, obviously as much as possible, but maybe not all the time, we link to our own activity ideas. And so then, you know, like the others have said, we just, we also have been building out, you know, we've all become <laughs> YouTube stars overnight. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's definitely been a challenge. I know for me, you know, talking on camera 
um, was not my favorite thing to begin with um, and certainly still struggle with it. Uh, but they are really fun to create and, and they offer just another way for us to connect with. So um, I will just take the opportunity real quick. Um, I, I didn't include anything about these pages, but for anyone who's interested in kind of continuing to explore a little more, we do also have some other great resources that were created by our school groups department. Um, and so our, we have a page called um, Teacher Resources for Distance Learning. And on that page, um, one of the really cool things that they created was actually how to recreate some museum exhibits at home. And so that one's really kind of just a unique and interesting twist on this um, sort of idea of continuing to explore the things you see at the museum at home. Um, and I definitely recommend checking that one out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, it's great to see so many great things um, happening at the Discovery Museum um, as always, but uh, how you've been able to take uh, the great things you do in the galleries and um, and bring them online and bring them home. So um, so we do have, um, we're starting to get some questions in the chat. So if you haven't, uh, if you have a burning question for the panel or for um, an individual, um, please do pop it into the Q&A. Um, and uh, one question I do want to ask before we get into that is, I'm curious from all of you, what has been the response from your family visitors? Um, are there any great stories of families um, that, uh, you know, of, of uh, you know, experiences people have had or um, uh, feedback you've gotten from, uh, from your users? I'll share one that just immediately comes to mind. I mean, of course, it's always, um, we don't necessarily actively do the whole like, oh, did you do something at home? Share it. I mean, that's certainly always, you know, and that's definitely a, a way to do that. And it's just not something we always work into. Um, and so I can just think of, for example, we had a fam, we actually had a guest video maker on. Um, we haven't had too many of those, but we had a um, honeybee researcher um, from Tufts University. She's actually at Providence College now, but um, who had delivered programming for us before at the museum, created a video on how to make a bee hotel. And we did, you know, a, a weekly email around that theme. And we had a family share the bee hotel that they made. And we were able to put that up, you know, on Instagram and on our website. So I just think those little moments are always really fun. Um, and we have been hearing we do a um, visitor survey. So from fam those are for families that do visit. Um, but even the families that are coming and visiting us have commented on the visitor survey that they are grateful for those at-home resources. So that's just always you know, great feedback to, to hear and have. I didn't mention, this is a, a program, it's really not in the education department, but it's called Art and Bloom. And um, I think most people are familiar with it. It's when uh, people interpret different artworks with flowers and flower arrangements. And we put it online <laughs> last spring because um, we'd closed. So, um, and we changed the rules. Um, People could use any materials. There didn't have to be one plant material in there, but we got such creative responses. Now, most of them were adults, but there were some younger kids and there were some um, like a parent and child doing it together. So we thought that was really successful. And we're actually planning on keeping that as part of our Art and Bloom, even when we're able to reopen and do the traditional way. Right. Yeah, um, we've had very positive responses. One um, grandmother wrote to us to say that she was able to do the programs with her two granddaughters out on her porch and how special it was for them to get to do that together, which was um, very sweet to hear. And we, um, we did some activities around Patriots Day, which is a big, big day in Concord. And um, a mom sent us a video of her two sons marching around their backyard to fife and drum music, holding sticks after they did our, our family program. So that was a really fun thing to see and made us all smile. <laughs> Great, yeah. Yeah, those are the things that just keep it, keep it going when, you know, when you're having a stressful day and uh, you know, getting those those stories and the, those those videos is always great. So, um, so we do have some um, so we do have have some questions. Um, one comes from Victor. Um, 
which is, has adapting to virtual programs revealed any ideas that weren't possible or weren't practical before? Um, I'm thinking about people or resources that you maybe couldn't bring into your bricks and mortar space, but you could connect your audience with them virtually. So any, anything, ways you've stretched your audience or topics or anything like that? Well, I think I, I mentioned earlier that um, in our African exhibitions, we're able to put up a lot more uh, resources like videos that you could look at or listening to music, those kinds of things that we wouldn't necessarily be able to fit into the exhibition. Yeah, so it's a way to expand your expand the exhibition beyond the beyond the four walls of the of the actual gallery. So I think for us too, it's really been a great way to just reconnect with people who had fallen off of, you know, um, you know, had either been members at one point in time and maybe had outgrown the museum or you know, different things like that. I, I think this has really been a great opportunity for us to re-engage those folks. And, and we have heard some of that too, of, of just families saying, you know, especially I think local families, you know, that is one thing that I think sometimes you overlook, right? The, the places that are right in your backyard because it is so easy to just say like, ah, oh, we can go there any day. Um, but we've heard, you know, from families who are either visiting or, or through, right, like our weekly emails who are saying, you know, I just, you know, I have to admit you guys have fallen off our radar or whatever it is, you know, that um, who are now making the time to, to re-engage with us, whether it's virtually or in person. And so I just think that this has been um, a, a great opportunity to, to reconnect with folks in that way. Um, well, in the in the clip that we watched, Kwame, Kwame Alexander was calling in from his apartment in London, and Melissa Sweet was in Portland, Maine, and you know it was really special to be able to talk with both of them, and it, which wouldn't have been possible at Family Trees, and it also allowed maybe for a more deeper engagement in the program in person. You know, you get to come up. I meet the author, sign the book, and they're all, I mean, incredible people and they make connections with you and ask questions. But with this kind of program, like I showed you, you know, there got, we had this whole back and forth between the author and illustrator. There were activities you could do afterwards. You were, it was a little more depth to the, the content of the program, I think. Great. Thanks. So, um, so getting down to, I think, some of the nitty gritty questions. Um, so we have some, some questions about technology and some questions about money. Um, so maybe we'll take money first, <laughs> um, which is um, one question is, um, how much of a priority is or was given to generating revenue um, when considering program development? I'll be honest and say that for us, it, it really wasn't. Like this was not, um, you know, for sure, our weekly emails always have the, you know, donate now button at the bottom of them. Um, but for us, it really, you know, I, I think we just, you know, we don't typically use our, our programming in that way. So, so our family programming that we offer is always um, free with museum admission, right? So, so whether you're a member and you're coming in for free in that moment, um, or you are a paying visitor, you have access to whatever that day's hands-on program is. And so we wanted to keep that model very much when it came to our virtual programs as well. I think, you know, like most institutions though, I would just say that, that we've certainly used it as a way for perhaps funders or sponsors to just sort of say like, hey, here is the content we are continuing to put out during this time, um, you know, and, and engage that way. Um, so, so yeah, so, and I, and I know that, you know, every museum at this point has had to sort of change up their model and how they do things. And, you know, we certainly started to think about, especially when we reopened and this is more for on-site programming, but would we ever go to a model where it was sort of like, you know, it's free, but you know, $2 donation or, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And comments on that. And, and, and I don't think we will, but I think, right. I mean, we all, I think reached the point where everything was on the table at that certain points so yeah for for us it wasn't at all a consideration 
Yeah, our, our family trees programs have always been free with admission, like Liz was saying, um, and it, we wanted to, to keep that model. It was a good resource for people to have. And, um, and, and many people, like I said, said, many people who attended the program also visited, so they paid in that way, or it was kind of a bonus after they visited, they saw the flyer that they could participate in this activity. So it was a little something extra for them. Um, so another another thing that has come up is um, is technology. And I actually have one question that's specifically for you, Allison, um, which is about, um, about the website um, that you developed and if it was complicated and difficult and what platform you used. Oh, sure. Um, it was all pretty simple. I, I don't know how to code. So I did not make this website. Um, I used Weebly as a platform. I kind of had an idea of what I wanted. So I knew that I wanted to be able to embed the videos inside of the page. And I knew that I had like these beautiful illustrations. So I wanted like big splash pages like you saw where I could blow up images really large and play around with like text and fonts and images in that way. Um, so I, I used Weebly and it was free and um, it, you know, it was all a very simple design to put together with their templates. So um, it worked really well for me. Oh, yeah. And let me kind of throw in maybe a larger technology um, uh, question to all of you. I, I, you know, I know you're all doing, you know, things with videos and all of that. And I'm curious to know what your, what technologies you're using. Is it, you know, are you doing something very high tech, low tech? Um, you know, what is, and any, any hints you might give to somebody who wants to start, um, you know, doing videos at their site. Well, we, we actually are, um, doing it in a couple different ways. Um, our curatorial department is doing videos of artists and they're sort of an interview thing. And in those cases, um, they, they work with um, an outside editor and I think they're doing the filming themselves, um, but they have this outside editor, which is what really takes a lot of the time. Um, for the hands-on art activity videos that we've made that the education fellows have made, um, they've made them at home using like their iPhone and putting it over something. But here's a good tip. Um, my current education fellow has a glass topped table and she puts the phone on top of the table and then works underneath the table with the hands. Mm. What she's doing. And I thought that's so simple and great. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> But um, yeah, we're going to set up in one of our studio classrooms a, a way to do some of those more simple videos. Yeah, I mean, we are doing ours at home with our iPhones, um, you know, editing them in iMovie. Um, and really, you know, one of my colleagues a few videos ago, like, set up her video and put music in it. And I was like, oh, my God, how did you do that? <laughs> you know. <laughs> not um i'm not tech savvy um your your tip about the glass top table i literally used i have one of those three tier white wire rack things and I, I cleared it off one day and i took off the bottom shelf put it on the table and i positioned my phone so that the camera was in between the two slots and and did the same kind of thing was able to fill my hands we have since invested in i guess i would just say like honestly, a tripod. Like if you don't have a tripod at home to, to hold your iPhone or your iPad, that was the best $30 I think we've spent all year. Um, you know, otherwise you, it's, you know, book stacks and things like that and trying to get your, um, just the, you know, right angle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, and I think, you know, it all really depends on what everyone's going for, but I, I think, you know, and we're all probably very similar, like we kind of want that, you know, home, made look in in a way you know we definitely because again in that spirit of you can do this at home too we you know we, we tried to kind of purposely keep them um a little more low tech we we bought a, a special holder for your iphone that goes on the tripod yeah yeah we got one of those like a gooseneck one that you can then like sneak it and yeah 
Yeah, it's, it is amazing what you can do with just very, mm -hmm. it's not low tech, but it's, you know, I mean, the quality of cameras, even again, just with a very basic iPhone or an iPad is just, I mean, it's just incredible the things that you can do. So, so, um, so great. Um, so, um, so one question I want to ask sort of, um, kind of before we leave is, so a lot of, a lot of people um, who are here are <coughs> perhaps thinking about developing family programs might be thinking about getting started on putting together materials at home or putting together a website or videos or things like that. Um, where would you advise people to get started? What do, what do you, any advice you would give to somebody who was looking to start a family program? Well, we really took inspiration from what we've already done. So, you know, we have been doing family trees for 25 years now, and we have these incredible authors and illustrators who know us and know the programs and want to partner with us. So if there's something that's at the heart of your mission and what you do, then grow on it and make it something special for these times. Yeah, in our case, um, most of what we do for educational programs or written materials, it's all based on our exhibitions or artworks in our permanent collection. Um, and the case of the recent videos um, that our education fellow made, we our Discover Ancient Egypt Gallery is the most popular part of the museum with kids. It's very interactive and we get lots of repeat visitors for it. So. Um, it's a good place to start. Whatever is, yeah. what, what's your strength? Yeah, I spent 10 years with the mummies. There's, no, there's really not much of a substitute for that. <laughs> so anything you would add, Liz? Um, yeah, I think I would also just, you know, one thing that we've kind of been doing in our education department as we create these virtual ones is we've just also been falling back on like, what are our favorites, right? So what are mm -hmm. our things you know to do at the museum with visitors um or what are you know what are our favorite things to do at home you know for those that have kids to to do with our kids and, and using that to then you know sort of translate into you know how we would present it to our visitors so i think that that's you know the things that you get excited and passionate about um you know that that passion and that excitement will come through and, and i think that absolutely what Alice and the same in terms of the mission of your own institution and, and you know what do you get excited what do you want people to know most about you and and really use that as the starting place great great and I just um and I want to share actually one comment that came through on the chat um for all of the the, the panelists um is uh, is from Liz um as a congregation we hope to connect families with families to encourage outings together I appreciate learning about your at-home activities. I will suggest this to family groups. I think they will be excited to visit your museums together as family groups or homeschooling groups during the week. So hopefully when, uh, hopefully when things get back to normal and we can all be going to museums again, we will, uh, you will have a lot of new fans. So, um, so I want to, uh, so I want to extend a thank you to, um, we're just about at our hour. So I want to extend a huge thank you uh, to Laura and to Allison and to Liz uh, for sharing their work um, and uh, for, uh, for, for looking at some of the great things they've been doing with families. And I hope that those of you out there will take inspiration and uh, we'll, uh, we'll try some, some, some things for the families in your own community. So thank you very much. Great, and thank you again, Laura, Allison, Liz, and Susie. This was excellent. I do wanna remind everybody that Freedom's Way has just launched its third partnership grant cycle, and there is a category in there for education and interpretive experiences. So we encourage you to take a look at um, our website, freedomsway.org, and you'll find a link there to the partnership grant information. And uh, feel free to reach out with us and let us know what you're thinking. So again, thank you all, um, and we hope to see you again soon. Take care.